Welcome to Promoting Scholarship Through Social Media. My name is Jennifer Salapa, and I serve as Managing Editor of Wing of Doc, a blog about innovation in academic medicine. The blog was launched by the AAMC nearly two and a half years ago in response to the passage of the Affordable Care Act as a way to encourage medical schools and teaching hospitals to share the innovations they devised as they adapted to healthcare reform. We now carry posts on everything from research and medical education to diversity, quality and safety, and population health. Actually, should we jump back to the housekeeping slide real quick? Mm -hmm. So here are a few notes for you participants today. You will hear audio through your computer. There's no need to dial into a teleconference line. Make sure your computer isn't muted and your sound is turned up. If you still have no sound in the upper left-hand corner of your room, click communicate, then audio broadcast. Type your questions or comments in the chat panel on the right-hand side and be sure to send to all panelists. We'll answer your questions during the Q&A session. Um, we're also going to be running a live poll during the session. So back to Wing of Zach. Does anybody, well I can't ask you, but the phrase Wing of Zach comes from a novel called The House of God that was uh, published in the late 1970s and we chose it for our name because during the novel the Wing of Zach is the brand new state-of-the-art wing of the hospital that's under construction and it represents hope. So we think we sort of represent hope on our blog as well. I'm joined today by Dr. Marlene Welch, Chief Division of Plastic Surgery at the University of Toledo Medical Center and Assistant Dean for Student Affairs at the University of Toledo College of Medicine and Sarah Soni's Associate Editor of Wing of Zach. Dr. Welch became a blogger last year. Anticipating Match Day of 2013, I reached out to ask her to write a post about the plight of the unmatched medical student, um, a topic of some concern to all of you on the webinar here today. I'll let Dr. Welch tell you what happened next. Hello. Thank you, Jennifer and Sarah, for inviting me uh, to participate again this year. Uh, as Jennifer said, I am an assistant dean in the Office of Student Affairs at the University of Toledo, and in this role as an advisor of medical students, I soon developed a passion about the fate of the unmatched student. And I actually reached out to the WMC and uh, started a study to look at the natural history of the initially unmatched students and who subsequently then later entered in GME. And around the same time, I was in the process of applying for promotion to associate professor, and that's when uh, Jennifer had contacted me about writing a blog for Wing of Zach. I was actually initially hesitant because I'd only recently started in student affairs, and I didn't really consider myself an expert in the area. But after I facilitated a roundtable discussion about unmatched students at the national meeting, I decided to write the post based on my experiences and my interactions with the other faculty at the WMC. I knew that the unmatched student was a really hot topic, and I saw writing the post on Wing of Zach actually as an opportunity to be a new voice on the subject. And this was also particularly important to me in the context of my upcoming promotion. Once I finally got myself to sit down and write, I actually did enjoy writing my blog. Uh, blog writing is first person. It's very different compared with scientific writing. I had a great experience with the staff at Wing of Zach. Jennifer was very patient with me about my procrastination issues, and she edited my submission and made me sound like I actually knew what I was talking about. Um, when my blog was posted on Wing of Zach the Friday before match day in 2013, I did get some comments on the website, but I started to receive several emails from faculty across the country and even from individuals who were unmatched students. Overall, the responses to my post were very positive, and the dean of my medical school even commented to me that he had seen and read my post. So last April, I did go up for promotion, and I listed my Wing of Blog, excuse me, my Wing of Zach blog post as a non-peer-reviewed publication, and I was going up on the clinical educator track. My blog was read by many faculty at my institution. I received a lot of positive comments about the timeliness of the commentary and the importance of the issue, and I really believe that the blog post did support my academic promotion by demonstrating recognition as an invited commentator on a highly regarded website for academic medicine. Jennifer later told me that my blog was actually the second most popular post on Wing of Zoc in 2013 with over 1,300 views. And in July, I was fortunate to be promoted to associate professor uh, with tenure. 
So this year, I was given the opportunity again to write a follow-up post about advising the unmatched student, and I continue to receive positive feedback and emails regarding these students, as well as uh, continued emails from individuals who are unmatched. And I'm grateful to the staff at Wing of Zoc for opening up this opportunity to contribute to the discussion about unmatched students. Thank you, Marlene. It's been great working with you. So thank you all of you for registering for this webinar. The purpose of our session today is to acquaint you with the many ways you can use social media to promote your research and advance your career. The strategic use of social media tools, including Facebook, Twitter, blogs, and others, can help you create a public profile and increase your stature in your field. If you want to stay online after the conclusion of the webinar, we are offering a bonus tutorial, Twitter 101. So Brian Cartabedian, who tweets as Dr. V and blogs at 33 Charts, is a pediatric oncologist at Baylor College of Medicine in Texas. He has 18,700 Twitter followers. Dr. Vardabedian participated in a panel at the 2013 Council of Teaching Hospitals meeting in which he posited that doctors have a moral obligation to be in the online space. As an example, he noted the misinformation that is frequently spread online about the relationship between childhood vaccines and autism. As he noted, the American Academy of Pediatrics has 60,000 members. If even a tenth of those members participate in the online conversation, they can control the search engine results and ensure the spread of accurate information. Vineet Arora, Assistant Dean for Scholarship and Discovery at the University of Chicago's Pritzker School of Medicine, also appeared on that panel last spring. She has 17,200 Twitter followers. She explained to attendees that she began exploring social media specifically as a way to promote her research. One of the defining features of scholarship, the currency of promotion in academic medical centers, is that it has to be shared, she said. Social media is one of the most powerful ways I've found to share information. She related the example of entering a social media video contest on SlideShare. Her team obtained the most shares on Facebook and Twitter, the greatest number of views, and ultimately won the title of Best Professional Video. Dr. Aurora says that to date the video has received over 13,000 views which she was able to highlight as a form of dissemination in a recent meeting with her department chair. She says that while digital scholarship is still under investigation with vocal critics and enthusiastic proponents debating the merits, digital scholarship does appear to have a place for spreading non-traditional media that cannot be shared or isn't ready to be shared via peer review. As you can see from her example, social media can be a powerful engine for disseminating your work. Research, uh, first, before we go any further, we'd like to do a quick poll to find out um, what webinar attendees' experience with social media channels is. So would you please quickly answer whether you have a Twitter profile or a Facebook page via the polling device on the right-hand side of your screen? So about half of you report that you do have a Twitter profile or Facebook page. Five of the 11 of you do. Our next question is, um, do you tweet? Could you please answer the poll? Yes or no? Uh, definitely not very many Twitter users in this group. All of, your, all of you who responded said no, you do not tweet. Oh, actually one of you said you do tweet. All right, our next question. Do you read blogs regularly, yes or no?
your response to that was split exactly 50-50. And our final question is, have you ever written a blog post? Okay, great. So four of you say that you have written a blog post. That's good. So um, research has shown that social media can be a very powerful engine for disseminating the results of your work. Recently, four investigators sought to determine the effect of blogging and tweeting about research in the clinical pain sciences. Publishing both the blog posts and the results of their study on PLOS One the authors reported that views of the research articles increased three to six-fold and that PDF downloads quadrupled. In a 2011 study, a researcher tried to find out whether tweets could predict citations. They can. Highly tweeted articles were 11 times more likely to be highly cited than less tweeted articles, and 75% of highly tweeted articles were highly cited, while only 7% of less tweeted articles were highly cited, the researcher wrote in the Journal of Medical Internet Research. A third study, also published on PLOS One, revealed that the volume of Twitter mentions is statistically correlated with downloads and early citations. And finally, a researcher found late last year that significant associations were found between higher metrics and higher citations when Twitter, Facebook, and blogs were used. It's important to be aware of the norms of an emerging discipline, that of digital professionalism. Its norms combine the idiosyncrasies of social media, such as its immediacy, emotionality, and the difficulty of retraction, with standards for how medical students, residents, clinicians, and faculty should conduct themselves online. This is also a lively area of study. One author writes in the Journal of Physician Assistant Education that for students in medical education who struggle to distinguish between personal and professional boundaries, social media provides yet another challenge. Incidents of unprofessional conduct and academic dismissal have been reported. But this doesn't have to be so. Kevin Foe, MD, creator of the popular Kevin MD site, has written a guidebook you may find helpful. Establishing, Managing, and Protecting Your Online Reputation was published early last year. It's worth reading in its entirety, but some of the high-level advice he offers includes protect yourself with a social media policy and disclaimer, maintain a higher standard of patient confidentiality than HIPAA, don't let your personal social media life distract you, and navigate the online waters mindfully. The American Medical Association has a formal policy on the use of social media. If your institution doesn't have a formal policy, the AMAs is a good one to follow. Promoting your research with a blog post offers lots of advantages. You can release early results to get reaction, engender participation, or solicit feedback. You don't have to wait for peer review. It's a casual, conversational way to discuss your work. Some people even blog about what didn't work. Blogging in the health professions has come a long way since this blog post was published in 2008 when two Canadian authors implored physicians, don't do it. Now, of course, there are millions of blogs, thousands of which relate to medicine and healthcare. On Wing of Zoc, we publish posts on a wide variety of topics, including diversity, research, care delivery innovations, technology and quality, as well as posts that are pure opinion or commentary. Posts are conversational in tone, they're casual, without footnotes or references, but we do like lots of links. The average length is about 750 words. We encourage authors to be candid about the costs and outcomes of their efforts. Our blog was created to share stories of successful initiatives academic medical centers were launching in response to healthcare reform. It's critical that the post contain sufficient detail that readers can make informed decisions about whether to try to create a similar initiative in their own institution. 
Some of the things that make a good blog post are a catchy headline, graphics, lots of links, and a photo and biography of the author. We ask our authors to include their contact information in case readers have questions. Today's post, which you're now seeing on your screen, about an online game that was created to build nephrology knowledge has all of these elements. You'll see that it has charts and graphs, and we're going to keep scrolling down. We're going to show you a few of these elements that are all combined in today's post. So if you go to wingandsock.org today, this is the one that you will see, and this gives a lot of great examples of elements that really draw readers in. How do we measure success? by site visits, page views, number of unique visitors, and other statistics that WordPress tracks for us. We also value pingbacks, readers who followed links from other sites, and cross posts when our post is published in its entirety on another site. By the way, the conventions of social media are that this can be done without your knowledge or permission. One example is Dr. Joanne Conroy's post that she wrote in response to Steve Brill's Time Magazine cover story Bitter Pill, Why Medical Costs Are Killing Us. Her post, which was originally published on Wing of Zach, was cross-posted on the Huffington Post, which drove a big spike in traffic to our site for the next several days. Some sites measure the success of a post by the number of comments it generates. This is not a meaningful metric for us. It seems that our readership just isn't interested in or comfortable with commenting. Also, many blog comments are just spam. However, the pure commentary and opinion pieces do generate more comments than the other types of posts. Another way we measure success is the number of times our tweet announcing the publication of a post is retweeted. This is a strong indicator of traffic and the value that the Twitter sphere puts on the subject matter. The importance of retweets can't be re overstated. But this is an example of the analytics for a live Twitter chat that we participated in two weeks ago, again, doing the exact same thing that you all are learning about today. We were promoting scholarship through social media. The AAMC had released a report called Advancing the Academic Health System of the Future, and we um, had Joanne Conroy, Dr. Joanne Conroy, who's the Chief Healthcare Officer here at the AAMC, be a guest at this HC Leader Chat, which happens every Tuesday night at 8.30. And what you can see here in these analytics is that the tweets in that hour, which numbered 1177, because they were retweeted by the followers of the tweet chat participants, resulted in over 11 million impressions. So that gives you an idea about how the reach of Twitter is multiplied exponentially. Of course, there are many blogs other than Wing of Zach that would also be delighted to publish your work. Your institution or department may even have a blog of its own. You can check our blog role to find lots of possibilities. How do you propose a post? In our case, at least, it's very easy. You send me an email describing what you want to write about and when. You tell me why you think our readers would be interested in what you have to say. I'll usually get back to you within a day or two. We provide valuable services to our authors, including extensive editing and fact-checking, as well as the addition of relevant links, multimedia elements, if appropriate, and social media promotion. We sometimes submit pieces to other sites for cross-posting, including Kevin MD, The Healthcare Blog, The Doctor Weighs In, HealthWorks Collective, and others. We participate in blog carnivals, which are roundups of posts on a similar topic or theme, such as Health Wonk Review, which is published every two weeks. We also publish our own monthly blog, Carnival Chart Review, which is a compendium of posts from other academic medicine blogs. The best way to prepare a blog post submission is to read the site regularly, becoming familiar with our subject matter and style. Remember, submission includes the word mission. Ours is to promote and share innovation in academic medicine. And now, if you have any questions on the material we've covered so far, we'd be happy to take them via the chat feature.
Okay, we're not seeing any questions coming in via chat, so we're going to go right on into our Twitter 101 tutorial, um, which is going to be led by Assistant Editor Sarah Sonis. And again, feel free to submit questions at any time. Welcome to the nuts and bolts of Twitter, or Twitter 101. This presentation will walk you through all the basics of Twitter, such as access, setup, and the variety of ways to utilize the social media site. Twitter is a real-time information social media network powered by millions of people all around the world. It is a collection of 140 character updates, or tweets, that Twitter users publish under their account names that then appear in a stream, resembling a rapidly updating news feed. On Twitter, you can both follow and communicate with other users. This is an example of a basic Twitter profile. The user, in this case, the wing of Zoc, the user's news feed is in the front center and, depending on the browser, often updates automatically. On the left navigation panel, users can access their follower streams, streams of other users they follow, and lists of topics. This is a basic full profile view of a Twitter account with a stream, follow button, and personalized user profile description at the top. Twitter can be accessed via an internet connection through laptops and computers, as well as through a data connection on smartphones and tablets. All smartphones have apps available for download to access Twitter. Most are free, including the basic Twitter app. Twitter has a very interesting history. The company began as a startup in San Francisco with inspiration drawn from text messages. The launch of Twitter branded the term microblogging, and today, Twitter stands as a leading microblogging social media site. This is a neat infographic via Mashable.com, a new site dedicated to all things tech and social media based that shows some groundbreaking breaking tweets or tweets that broke records for mention reach since Twitter's inception. Mashable has many informative resources on social media, technology news, and tools, including descriptive, infographics. So who uses Twitter? As you can see from these next few slides, a wide variety of people. Many physicians, writers, and bloggers use Twitter to engage their audiences and in addition to posting on their blogs and websites to further disseminate information. Many academic, academic medical centers have Twitter accounts that they use to communicate with students, patients, and the public. Many journalists have begun to use Twitter as a news dissemination and engagement tool. In fact, Twitter has been dubbed similar to that of a wire service by many journalists. Due to its user-friendly format developed in order to accommodate short, instant updates, Twitter has become a, leading, a leader in breaking news. This is a, an example of a Twitter news stream. Tweets appear in chronological order, and all tweets must be 140 characters or less. Generally, one tweet is used to drive a single point across, which leads to some creative thinking in order to drive messages home using the 140 character limit. Twitter also has a variety of commonly used symbols designed to enhance message reach, user visibility, and encourage conversations. The most common symbols are the hashtag, the at symbol, and the RT mention, all displayed on this slide. This is an example of a basic tweet from Barack Obama's Twitter account. As you can see, it is very simple with no links. The next tweet below from the Wing of Zoc account contains a shortened link in order to direct people to information. Most tweets contain links due to character limits. Which brings us to our next point, shortened URLs. Many URLs are too long to include in a tweet. They simply take up too many of the 140 characters you are allowed. Luckily, there is a solution, URL shorteners. A good one to use can be found at www.bit.ly. Bit.ly is a simple URL shortener to use because a Bit.ly account can be linked with a Twitter account. For example, we sign into Bit.ly with our Wing of Zoc account name and password, making it easy to send shortened URLs right from Bitly. 
Just copy and paste the link into Bitly, write or edit your tweet, and then send. The ad symbol identifies a specific Twitter user handle. Each handle is unique. When directing the tweet at another user, be sure to use the ad handle in order for the mentioned person to see their mention. The ad symbol is also used to carry on a conversation and dialogue. Notice how the tweet in this slide, directed from the healthcare blog, reaches out to Vox's Sarah Cliff by using the ad symbol in front of Sarah Cliff's Twitter handle. Sarah Cliff will then be notified that the healthcare blog tweeted something, something mentioning her. The ad symbol can also be used to carry on a conversation, which will appear in all feeds of those mentioned throughout the dialogue. Including the handle along with the ad symbol makes it clear that you are directing your tweet at a specific person. At Madeline, Madeline Albright tweeted at the UN, United Nations, and the ad symbol not only indicates a mention, but tracks the conversation. The hashtag symbol is a way of tagging a topic or talking point. If you all observe the feed on the screen, you will see Medicare is hashtagged. This means that all tweets with a Medicare hashtag will make the word Medicare a live link and will appear in the Medicare hashtag feed. Additionally, hashtags are often abbreviated, but are given context through the text in the tweet. For example, Lauren Miller used the hashtag MassHolly and MassSen for Massachusetts politics and the Massachusetts Senate. Here are some good tips to remember about hashtags. Hashtags are only used for key terms. When you are tweeting about a specific topic, use the hashtag in front of the key subject. Lastly, common hashtags for a specific subject can be learned by reading tweets on the subject or also by a simple web search. RT is an acronym for retweet. When users like or agree with tweets, they can use the RT function, which copies and repeats the tweet, leaving the original handle and tweet in place. The next two slides are a collection of tweets demonstrating how Twitter is a great social media tool to use for advocacy purposes and also as a way to follow breaking news. Many hashtags are created for advocacy in order to create and encourage online conversation around a certain issue, such as hashtag MedEd, the ACA hashtag, and hashtag HCSM, which stands for Healthcare Social Media. This hashtag is used to indicate a resource in this subject area or an issue-related tweet. Twitter also has the power to function as an aforementioned wire service. The microblogging feature allows for short, timely updates users can skim quickly. Many organizations like the Washington Post, local radio stations, and national alert outlets use social media to distribute their breaking news first. Access to breaking news and updates is another reason to create a presence in the Twitter sphere. This infographic demonstrates how Twitter is used for promoting your works in science, research, and scholarship areas. Using Twitter to further publicize research provides a wider audience for your work, expanding it to those interested in your area of study but who might not have otherwise seen the work. For example, the infographic states that tweets linking to peer-reviewed PDFs are retweeted 19% of the time, exponentially increasing dissemination. Many thought leaders and policymakers are active on Twitter, making Twitter a great outlet for science and research-related resources because the audience is amplified and microblogging engenders conversation. According to this infographic, one in 40 scholars have a presence on Twitter, and 55% of Twitter users who follow research publications identify themselves as scientists, science students, or scientific organizations. On this final slide, you can see some additional resources that will enable you to learn more about utilizing Twitter and social media tools. Like we mentioned before, 
Mashable is a great site for up-to-the-minute tech news. Twitter's blog also features up-to-the-minute news about Twitter, updates to the website, and handy tools and tricks to make utilizing the tool a little bit simpler. Additionally, the AAMC has some great resources on institutions and their social media policies, all posted on the website. University of Utah, an AAMC member institution, has, made, has designed this handy resource, also titled Twitter 101, that is available for download for free on their site, Algorithms for Innovation. This Twitter guide has many tools, tricks, and tips designed to simplify and streamline the Twitter user experience from those who are just thinking about developing an account or for those who feel like they, might, they could use a refresher. These resources will be included all in our final slide deck that we will distribute to webinar participants. Thank you for joining us. This has been Wing of Zoc, Twitter 101. At this time, we will be taking any questions that you might have. So one of our participants asked if we can give some good examples of Twitter accounts to follow. Um, yes, and we often do this as sort of a roundup on Fridays. You'll see when you look at Twitter on Fridays, you'll see the hashtag double F, which stands for Follow Friday. And um, people use that in, for two different reasons. Sometimes they use it as a way to um, acknowledge and thank the followers that have joined their account in the past week. And sometimes people use it as a way to recommend um, other Twitter accounts to follow. So um, if you go on Twitter tomorrow and do um, hashtag double F, you will find lots of suggestions um, on Twitter accounts to follow. And if you're interested particularly, obviously, in healthcare topics, you might um, search the hashtag HCSM, which stands for Healthcare Social Media. You can also go look at the Wing of Zach Twitter followers, and people who are following us are always good to, to follow as well. Um, another question we got is, what other social media platforms should I consider, if any? We, because these things do take time and effort, we have restricted our social media efforts for Wing of Zach to um, the site itself and to Twitter. For, so, for example, we do not have a Facebook page or a Pinterest account, but there are certainly lots of um, opportunities out there. Instagram, and people use all of those tools for different reasons and in different ways. But we really try to focus our attention on Twitter, and we find that it does lead a lot of visitors to our site. Another question we see is, for those who might be a little bit nervous about diving right in um, to just setting up a Twitter account in real time, a great way to learn your way around the site and any social media site is creating a dummy account and uh, sending a few test tweets from that account to really get you comfortable around the, around the Twitter sphere and with using all of the symbols cohesively. Um, a great way to connect with other professionals via social media is at meetings and conferences. Many meetings and conferences have a hashtag that people use to tweet out the highlights of the presentations, and, that th and those are often avidly followed by people who cannot attend the meeting or conference in person. Um, the GRA Spring Meeting, I believe, is going to have a hashtag that people can follow so that even if you can't make it to the meeting, you can see what's going on. That's a great way to connect with other people who are interested in the same events you are. And the hashtag for that meeting will be hashtag lead GME and will be printed on the final program so that all attendees at the GRA meeting can tweet and follow along on social media. Is this a fad? Um, I don't know. 
Maybe, but um, it doesn't seem like it. I certainly think that it's had a longer lifespan uh, than I expected it to. There are many more people on Twitter than I expected there to be. I'm surprised at how much traffic we get from it. Um, so if it is a fad, it's going to be a fairly long-lived one, I think. Um, if you are interested in training your residents uh, in social media, again, we do think it's a good idea for your institution to have a policy. If you don't have your own social media policy, follow the AMA guidelines. Um, we do offer some tools about digital professionalism. We have, um, in, under the auspices of our group on information resources, developed a toolkit on digital professionalism that might be helpful to you. You can visit www.aamc.org slash GIR to download that toolkit for free. It also addresses some curriculum topics that you might find useful. Any other questions? Okay, well thank you so much for attending. You can find contact information for me and Sarah, both in the slide deck and on the wing of the back about S page. Please don't hesitate to contact us with questions with blog post suggestions, um, with anything at all, and um, stay in touch. We hope to have we hope to have a whole no, new bunch of people to follow on Twitter. So when you all get your accounts up and running, send a tweet and say CC at Wing of Zach, and we will see you on there, and we will start following you. Thanks so much.